I am here to talk about Nomad and how that enables running workload at the edge. Um, it's great to be here in person again, although it's a little more nerve-wracking than doing it, doing it at home like it was. And so for those that might not be familiar, I just wanted to give a quick overview of what Nomad is. Uh, Nomad is a workload orchestrator, so you give it a task, and it will place that on any number of clients for you, and it will maintain the life cycle of that task. So if you want 10 of them, it will place 10. If one fails, it will replace that for you. Um, one of the kind of nice key features of Nomad is that it can run on any operating system, ARM, Windows, Linux. Um, we also have a system called Task Drivers. So these are plugins where you can run any kind of application. Nomad will manage that for you. So that can be uh, Docker, Podman, uh, Java, Roixec. Uh, we have Windows services. Um, and if none of those suit your needs, you can write your own. It's a plugin system. So if you fulfill the interfaces, um, you can run your applications. We had someone run uh, drones using uh, plugins. We also have um, first-class Nomad integrations. Uh, so what typically happens is uh, you might run console alongside Nomad. So if you're using uh, service discovery, service mesh, uh, console KVs, uh, we integrate natively with that. And then maybe further down the line, uh, you might want to run Vault. So if you were here at uh, Mike Nomich's talk, um, Vault can then provide a database secrets, passwords, um, and TLS and kind of PKI uh, information to your tasks. Um, that's a very rapid and brief overview. Um, I'll share some links later if you want to learn anything more. Uh, and who am I? This is me, just with glasses now, because age. Um, I'm in a senior engineer working on Nomad. Uh, I've been at HashiCorp for about two and a half years. Uh, I work both on Nomad Core, so the, the Nomad Dynamy, but also ecosystem projects. So that might be the Autoscaler, Nomad Pack, or even some of the task drivers that we run. Um, I've also been a, a Nomad user since 0 0.4, so I've used it at different companies. So if you want to talk about how it was compared to how it, was, how it is now, um, I can help answer that. And so what is edge compute, um, edge workload, or just edge, uh, as people call it? It's another buzzword that you have to use and learn. Um, but compared to things like serverless or cloud, it might be a little bit more accurate than those. Um, and so um, let's have a look at what it is. So one of the main features is that it is graphically distributed. So it runs, main, it, it runs mostly outside of your traditional data center. Um, this might be for data locality reasons. So potentially, you want to have uh, your data close to your users. That might be for legal reasons. Uh, you might be you know, using storing uh, customer data. And that country um, has particular rules around its uh, citizens' data. You might also want to run it uh, close to users for a better user experience. You might, be, you might think of something like a content delivery network, right, where the actual data the user is, is connecting to is close to them. Um, it makes a great user experience. It also saves you costs in data transfer, right? You can, you can put that data there once, um, and you don't have to transfer it across the Atlantic, for example, all the time. Um, edge work is sometimes typically run on underpowered machines. Uh, that could be in CPU, in memory. Um, disk, I.O. is another thing. Um, and sometimes, unlike running on EC2, um, they're harder to upgrade. Um, and when we look at the actual edge compute markets, we'll understand a bit more of why that is. Um, and the constrained nature is um, also applicable and quite heavily applicable to the network. So they might be running on a poor network, a satellite, a DSL, um, you know, LTE, for example. Um, it might be also running very, very distant to your actual core data center. So you might have lots of hops in the way between where the work is running and your core data center. And so there's lots of things that can go wrong in all of those providers. And so what is, what are these edge markets, right? Oh, no, one more slide, sorry. Um, and as well, um, your traditional data centers are probably running all the same operating system. The applications might be written in the same language, Java, Golang, whatever you're fancy. <coughs> Edge isn't so much like that. You might have a very distributed mix of, uh, of operating systems. Your applications might also be very different depending on what that user is and what they're doing. And send now to what Edge markets are. Um, this is my favorite illustration of um, Edge compute. Uh, this is a smart indoor vertical farm. Um, and this isn't a data center but we have to run workload here, right? 
Um, so we think of things like uh, monitoring the water levels and the pH levels of the water. We need to make sure there's enough light because we're indoors to grow the crops. Um, we also have to manage the CO2 levels. Uh, the crops need CO2 to grow, so we need to make sure there's enough CO2 in there, but maybe also monitor it so that anyone working in there that doesn't have a mask on uh, doesn't suffer ill effects of that. And we can see at the bottom, we've got these rollers, and that's for crop rotation, so that the crops move to the right place at the right time. And so when they're fully grown, when they're established, they're, they come to the end of the conveyor belt and so they can be grown um, and, to, and picked and served fresh to the likes of you and me. And so I've talked about smart farming. Um, IoT, the Internet of Things, is probably something that most people are familiar with. Um, you know, and everything connected to the Internet. Think of your toaster, right? Um, monitoring how long your toaster's been in the toaster, what, what uh, heat degree you had it on, so that you always get the perfect slice of toast. It's just brilliant, right? Um, gaming servers, I will talk about in a bit later, so I'm going to skip that over for now. Smart transport um, may be synonymous with things like self-driving cars, um, but there's lots of other applications to this, right? Um, satellite navigation, make sure that you're missing traffic uh, jams, make sure you're not running on tolls that you don't want to pay for. Um, if you were at Mike No Mitch's talk earlier, um, making sure you meet the bus on time, um, bus displays, train displays, to make sure that you know what, what's going on at the right time. Um, it can also be for enforcement ideas, so AMPR, automatic number plate recognition, um, and speed cameras, so things that everyone loves. Biotech is kind of a weird one, um, and has probably become more prominent in the past few years. So biotech, the idea that researchers can uh, run their experiments um, and get access to the data quickly. Um, you think these researchers are running lots of experiments all in a line to get the data, um, and Edge is kind of you know, running in a DNA sequencer or running in a pipette. You know, how this data can be shared across all of these devices so that the researcher's job and the researcher's experiments are more efficient and easier for them to come to the right conclusions. In-store technology is probably as broad as IoT. Um, In-store technology, the things like um, your advertisements, right? So you go into a shop, and you'll have a billboard of showing what's on sale today, or you know, buy two of these, get the third one that you didn't need for free. Um, you also have point-in-sale, um, so where you actually go to pay. You have your, uh, you know, your, your self-registers, uh, where you can go and just buy your stuff yourself. Um, and we even have things just like, in general, running the store, you know, general store services to keep that store comfortable for you uh, and comfortable for the people that are working there. And so now we've got an overview of um, what edge compute markets are. I want to go through kind of cluster topologies. So uh, what does a traditional cluster look like compared to what an edge cluster might look like um, to really understand some of, the, com some of the, um, the problems that can arise in these two setups. And a traditional cluster, so this kind of is the same whether you're running it on my laptop, uh, whether you're running it on the home lab, or whether you're one of Nomad's biggest customers running at some of the biggest scale. Um, these kind of all ring true for any of those. The first is um, very stable internet connectivity. Um, all the agents, no matter whether you're running in server or client mode, are probably always talking over LAN, and they probably always have sub-50 millisecond uh, round trip between them. Um, and it's a stable internet. You're not going to drop out. You're not using packets. Um, it just works. And the second is the right size, right size machines. Um, so if you're running a particular type of workload and you know you need a certain amount of CPU and memory to run that work, you will size your machine adequately for that work. Um, if further down the line you want to run something like console, maybe you'll increase the size of that machine so you can handle consoles overhead. Um, and changing those instances isn't a big deal if you're running in something like Amazon EC2. Um, or you, know, you might click the button, or you might use Terraform to do that. And that's simple and available for you to do. And so <laughs> forgive my drawing, um, but this is what it looked like, a really simple example of a, a core data center. right? So this is a nomad region that's located in the physical data center. Um, you might have more than one server. But we have a server where all the state and the reconciliation happens. Um, and then we have a number of clients. They're all connected closely. They're all running together. Um, you might have more than one data center, but they'll all be carbon copies of this. So they'll be kind of rubber stamped. And so that might be for multi-region. That also might be for multi-cloud. Um, and they will be connected by something like DirectLink uh, or a VPN solution, um, as what you want. 
And so this is really where the network comes into play. Now, this is my interpretation of uh, what an edge deployment might look like. We have, in the middle, we have the same core data center. Um, and in this core data center, this is uh, the only server that all the servers that are running within this whole setup. They have clients, so they can run some of your core, your core compute. So if you've got a monitoring stack, you might run that there. But then we have this kind of very distributed, very different kind of client edge data center topology. Um, they're running different numbers of clients, potentially different sizes of clients. Um, they're also very distant, different distances from that core data center. So they might be very close, maybe running in a built adjacent, um, and they might be very far, you know, across the Atlantic, different country. We also have some clients that aren't really in a data center. They're kind of out there by themselves. So again, if we think of a toaster or maybe like a handheld device, it doesn't kind of fit the analogy of being in a data center. It's just there and connects back over whatever connection it has, LTE, um, satellite, for example. And so this is where the network really comes into play um, and where the networking in Nomad becomes important. And so for that, I wanted to kind of give an overview of Nomad networking. And so bear with me on this one. Um, unlike console, so if anyone's familiar with console, um, all console agents, no matter what mode you're running in, run in a gossip pool so that they can understand membership of the agents. Um, Nomad doesn't do that, uh, which is good for um, scalability. Uh, and we do it a different way uh, for Nomad. So we use a heart beating mechanism. So only the servers here are in a gossip pool to discuss membership. So the servers discuss their own membership. The clients discuss membership via a heart, uh, a heart beating process. And so this heart beating process runs on a loop. Um, and it's the client saying to the server, hey, I'm here. This is my ID. And I'm ready. I'm in status ready. And so the servers use that, and they understand that that client heartbeated within a time frame, and it's ready for me to place work on it. The work is shared via another RPC, um, a data RPC. Um, and so this is a bidirectional uh, communication between the two. The server might tell the client to run a piece of work, to stop a piece of work. Um, the client might tell the server, hey, I've started this piece of work you asked. It's running fine. This piece of work failed. You need to go and place it somewhere else. Um, and anything in between, like, hey, I've stopped this. But what happens if this kind of heart beating, this data layer, disconnects? Um, and so we get to our kind of flaky network. The first thing that generally happens, well, there's two things that happen simultaneously. Um, but you'll see that the allocations have moved to lost. Um, the servers will, will designate them as state lost. It will then try and place new allocations, if it can, on another machine. So, hey, this work's failed. This client's failed. We're going to go and put that somewhere else. The client will also move to a down state. Um, in a down state, uh, no more scheduling will happen onto that node. Um, and Nomad's really good at that. It reconciles state, understands what you need, keeps going. But then what happens if that node reconnects? That's a you know, flaky network, something got in the way, someone misconfigured something. You know, these things happen. So how can we kind of, what happens? In terms of the allocations, uh, generally one of two things will happen. Uh, you'll see at the top that one has gone away from the box, one has been moved. Um, nomads may prefer the newly placed allocation to the previously placed allocation. So, when Nomad does a scheduling um, decision, it does a scoring system. Um, and maybe the new allocation is best placed to run this. To run, or maybe the new client is best placed to run this work. What more often than happens um, is that the previous client is understood to be the best place. Um, but the Nomad servers don't have a good understanding. And it can't be sure that that allocation is running as you expect. Um, and that, you know, Nomad has no idea what's running in there. It can't understand it. And so it has to assume, hey, this allocation, we're not sure, and it will restart it. So even though that might have been running OK, um, we're restarting that. So that might impact your users if they were connected to it fine. Um, and so in, in situations and clusters where your network is a bit finicky, it's a bit uh, prone to kind of breaking, um, this can cause a lot of workload churn. Um, it adds additional stress to the servers. It's something that Nomad can handle, but it could be better spent you know, placing new work that you want. What new features uh, were added in Nomad 1.3? Um, 
to kind of help this edge work and to make it a better, better suited tool for edge work. Um, the features I'm going to discuss were both kind of directly created to, for edge workloads. Um, some were also indirectly created, so we're going to take a look at those. And so the first, again, if you were here this morning, you might have seen this, is disconnected clients. Um, so the previous heart beating failure model was something that you had no control over. That was the failure model. That was what happened. Um, disconnected clients gives operators a way to control that failure model and what happens. And that works by adding two new states to Nomad. Um, and while two new little states might seem trivial um, and easy, uh, states to allocations and nodes are core to Nomad. And so props to Derek and Tim for their work on this. It was great. Um, and so these two new, new statuses are allocations can become uh, unknown and nodes can become disconnected. So they're kind of these new transitioning states where we have this kind of in-between to account for disconnected clients. And this is, a, this is how it's configured. Um, it's one parameter to the task group, uh, which translates to an allocation. And so max client disconnect is a time duration. And it instructs Nomad, well, this allocation is expected to run uh, on a client which we, we, we understand might disconnect. And so if this allocation is on a disconnected client, um, Nomad will mark the allocation as uh, unknown, and the node is disconnected rather than lost and down. If the client is disconnected for longer than one hour, uh, it follows the old routine. So we will we'll mark it as lost and down and continue on our way, and then the same process will happen. Um, if it reconnects before one hour, uh, fine. The, the allocation transitions to running without restarting it, which is pretty important, and the node will come back to a, a registered up state or ready state. The second is Nomad uh, Native Service Discovery. Um, as we know, not all clients might be able to run console alongside Nomad. And so Native Service Discovery gives us a way to easily register and discover services via the Nomad API. Um, this doesn't add any new information per se to Nomad. Uh, to be clear, like all this information was available within Nomad. We're just packaging it up in an easier way to consume and to discover. And this is configured like this, super simple. Um, there's a new block called uh, the provider block. Uh, it supports Nomad or console uh, and starts to treat service discovery like a plugin system that we have for task drivers. So you can say, hey, I want this service to register in Nomad. You might have a mixed cluster, so you might have another service which registers in console. Um, and if you omit this, uh, it will keep the old behavior and it will go into console. <laughs> so live demos. Uh, I don't know if I've missed them, and I don't know if they've missed me. So we're going to see how well this goes and work through the problems together. Um, I'm going to demo disconnected clients and service discovery um, and kind of how they can work together for your edge uh, compute. Uh, and this is the architecture that I'm going to be trying to run. So we have uh, the core data center, as I've kind of shown in all my slides. This is running our state, our servers. Uh, we're also going to be running our monitoring stack. And we're going to be running our custom kind of Go application and user data, right? our, our database of users and accounts. Um, 200 milliseconds uh, is fine for logging into a server or logging into a website. It's fine for doing account settings, maybe buying a new game. Um, but it's not fine if you're playing online games with other people. Um, Doom, maybe you'll get away with 200 milliseconds. But if you're playing a first-person shooter, 200 milliseconds is a long time. It's a bad, it's a bad experience. Um, and it will cause you problems. Um, maybe, maybe you abuse ping, maybe you don't. But that's why we're here. We're going to run Doom closer to the user. So we have an edge data center in London, because that's where I am. Uh, and we have one in Stockholm. Uh, unfortunately, that's under construction. We don't have that yet. But we're going to place these Doom servers closer to the user so they have the best experience for what matters to them. And now, let's see how we're going. So. Uh, I have here a Nomad cluster, if I remember all my commands. So we have one server, um, which is running in our Europe region. So all of these are contained within the same Nomad region. Um, they're just running in what we call distinct data centers. Uh, and if we see Nomad node status, typing in front of people is horrible. Um, you can see that we've got one client, which is in our core data center. And then we have two in our edge 
England data center. So this is where we're going to put our Doom servers, our Doom workloads, um, and our customer data. Uh, we can also see this in the UI, if you prefer looking via the UI. Um, it's there, and I'm not running any jobs, so there's no magic going on behind the scenes. The first thing I'm going to deploy is Prometheus, because we want to store our metrics somewhere. So we're going to have a look at Prometheus. Oh, I need to go here. Yeah. Uh, and if we take a look at the service stanza, you'll see that we have this new provider block. So we're going to register this Prometheus service within Nomad. There is also this new uh, address field added in 1.3 as well. Traditionally, Nomad calculates the address that will be registered as the service by itself. Um, and that's probably the most conventional and still probably the best way to do it. Um, I'm running this demo on EC2. Um, and the EC2 public IP address isn't available to the kernel on, on the machine. Uh, so Nomad has no way of discovering that. And so this means that I can just override that value, and I can put my own parameter in there. Um, because I'm not using console, um, I'm using this right behind me up here, uh, this EC2 SD configs, um, so I can discover all the instances that are running in different regions across, across um, Amazon. Uh, this bit particularly useful took me ages to figure out the syntax. Uh, but because uh, some of the clients are running in the edge data center, we have to travel over the public internet to connect to them and to scrape their metrics. And so we need to relabel the private IP address that's discovered to be the public IP address. And so we can go and run that. Does that go away for a second? Um, I'm just going to cut it short. And so now we have this new top level service command. Uh, so if you've used console before, you might be familiar with how some of this looks. Um, and so we can list, we can get the info. If your state gets a bit wacky and a bit wild, we have a delete command so that you can tidy up any orphan services. Um, if I've done my job, you shouldn't need to use that, but it's there just in case. Uh, and so now we can have a look at Nomad service list. And you can see that we have core Prometheus registered, no tags. Um, and we can now have a look at the information we have. If you can all see that, just if you can't, just please go up here. Uh, it's really high now, isn't it? <laughs> you can see that we've got, we've got the job ID. Um, you know, this might differ to, to console because we have information that we want in the service registration. So we've got the job ID. We have the address. You can see we've got the public IP address with the ephemeral port. Um, I haven't put any tags in. And you can see the node and allocation that they're on as well. So you can do things like identify nodes that are maybe running too many services. Um, and it's just useful look up information. So I'm going to take this address and try and get all of it to show you that it does work. And cool. So now we've got Prometheus, and we look at the targets. And you can see that we've, we've scraped all of our kind of core data center. We've scraped all our edge clients. And we're even scraping ourselves as Prometheus, which is cool. But Prometheus is kind of lacking in good data visualization. So with that, we're going to run Grafana on top of that. Um, and so let's get over all the dashboard, which embedding is probably a bad idea. Um, <coughs> we can see here we're, we're creating a, a, data, a data source for, for Grafana. We want it to connect to the Prometheus backend, Ooh, say that fast, um, and then get the data so that it can visualize it. Um, and in particular, we have this, uh, this template uh, function, which is called Nomad Service. So Nomad under the hood uses console template. So we've added these to console template, and we import that library. Uh, in this one, we're looking up the core Prometheus service by itself. Uh, you can, if you want, do Nomad Services with an S on the end, um, remove the core Prometheus, and it will look for all services in the namespace. Uh, it's important to note that the lookup is tied to the namespace of the job. So if you're running a job in the namespace of platform and you're running another job in the namespace of default, they can't look at each other at the moment. So it's just something to be aware of. And so I will go and run that one. It'll go away, do its thing. Um, if the internet's working, it shouldn't take so long. Um, if we go and do a list, uh, we can see that the Grafana is there. And now we're going to go and grab Grafana, grab this, put it there. Oh, damn, did I miss something? OK, well, there we go. Uh, we'll browse our dashboards, and you know, I have this 
very basic dashboard. Um, I need some skills here. But we can see like we can see how much CPU we have available across the entire server farm. Uh, and we can see the memory. Um, and these hopefully should be populated as I move through the demo. Now we're going to run our, what job should we run first? Let's run our core game launcher. Um, the game launcher is my horribly written code um, with a lovely UI. Um, what this will do is it will start dispatching a job um, so that you as a client can log on to this and you can say, hey, give me a server, and it will launch that for you. So let's run that. That should be easy. And then for the edge, we're running this parameterized job. So when we register this, we won't get an allocation, but we can dispatch that. So we provide it a client ID, and we say, hey, give me an instance of this job. And we're using that client ID to register the service so we can understand what services are tied to what client. And importantly, we're setting this max client disconnect. So we understand that this job is going to be running on clients that might kind of have temporary uh, network disconnects. And we don't want that to impact uh, the player, right? We don't want that. That's not the, that's not the player's fault. Uh, we can handle that. So we're going to run, run this. And so we don't get the kind of the following idea because there's no allocations. We've got the <laughs> successful job register, which is right below my head. Um, and it's there. So we can go over to the jobs now. And you can see we've got this parameterized job, but there's no running groups for that. Uh, we're going to do a service list again. And you can see we've got our core game launcher. So we're going to look at the, uh, the service registration for that. We're going to grab that. And you'll see, you will all see my handiwork at uh, UI design, because that is snazzy. Um, you can see we've got the game server generator. Um, I'm going to put my client ID in here, which is JRizel, and. We've only got UK region that is available at the moment, Scandinavia coming soon. What that doing behind the scenes is it's dispatching the job. Uh, it is waiting for that, that allocation to run, uh, become available. And then we're finding the service via the service registration API. Um, and we can see we've got a URL here. Uh, we can go and click on that. Um, and so we now have. We'll go and play a new game of Doom. And you can see I can run around. So that's me doing things and, and kind of shooting, right? Um, we'll leave that there. So now, now our client, our company's client, has their game server running. They're happily playing. Um, but what happens when this client disconnects? Um, you know, we have some network instability. Let's go and see what's happening. I don't know, that won't work, will it? So we're going to look at the, the status of the allocation. If someone else ran a Doom server, good. I'm glad you did, because there's two instances of that job running. Um, and I'm going to actually have a look here. Hey, good. There's only limited space. So if you're running a Doom server, good. Else of you, maybe you won't get time. Sorry. Um, there is status. We're going to look at the allocation ID. Uh, we're going to find the, the node that this is running on. So we've got the node ID here. Uh, we're going to do verbose. And so you can see we've got all these al allocations running on this node. Um, but this node is going to start to become unstable, right? Um, so let me grab the public IP address, which is 1821. I'm going to switch over to this tab. And we can go env. And I've got some cheats. And so I'm going to put this um, IP tables rule in. So the IP tables rule is going to block all the traffic from the client to the server. So in all sense and purposes, they're disconnected. Uh, so we can go and if I remember my IP tables, we can see here uh, we've got this rule, but it's not dropped anything yet. 
Here we go. OK, so now we've started dropping traffic. Uh, we're blocking that client-server communication. If we go over to our Nomad UI, we can have a look at the clients. And oh, that's not going to be the way to do it, is it? Let's go back here, Nomad node status. It will take a minute because, OK, less than a minute. Uh, the servers allow for a kind of a grace period of heartbeats to fail. And once that grace period is reached, then we mark it as disconnected. So you can see that the, the node is now disconnected. Um, if I look at my, my allocation status, oh, no, that's not very good. Uh, it's because I don't know which job is mine. Well, OK, it doesn't really matter. It's everyone's jobs. Um, you can see that. Oh, no. You can see that the allocation that was previously running is now moved to unknown. It's still running, though. Uh, we just modified the status. Nomad has preemptively started a new allocation. Um, Nomad doesn't quite know the status of that, so it will start one just in case you need that, in case you have your own automation to start utilizing that server. Um, but if we go back to the terminal here, um, you know, as the user, I'm still running around fine. So I don't want that to, to stop. And now. If I'm going to go back and grab my env, we're going to restore the connectivity. So here we have um, the network has restored itself. The client and servers can talk again. And we're going to clear that out. Uh, not that one yet. Yeah. Give it a minute, because we need the traffic to pick back up. Now it's transitioned back to ready, which is cool. Um, the more important thing is what happened here. I don't know what's going on. That's quite a shame. Uh, <laughs> let's have a look at the status of the node, which was this one. You can see we have all our Doom servers still running. And if I check this one, oh, maybe I broke my cluster. Oh, well. Um, <laughs> That's a shame. Uh, so I will go back. Let's see if we can see anything on the data from the UI. OK, this is probably a bit of a feather variance, I think. You'll see that on Grafana, we're running with four, four servers that are running. Um, then as that client goes down, uh, we have four that are unknown, four that are in state running. So we've, the client's disconnected, four we're not sure about. We, so we started four in place. When that server, when that client reconnects, uh, we stop the four that were running preemptively, because the previous four are the best placed. Um, so they move to complete, and then we have four that are running again, none that are unknown. And if, if I've done this properly, I should be able to go back here. And my server's running fine. So from the user perspective, nothing's happened. They're still playing their game. They don't know about any of the network incidents that have happened. From the operator understanding, I know that my cluster has been broken, but it's kind of self-resolved itself. Um, which is perfect, which is what I want. Oh, it kind of worked. <laughs> and so that's, I've covered the top two here, um, Service Discovery and Edge Reconnect. I wanted to give a shout out to some of the other features in 1.3. Um, in particular, CSI, um, kind of a hot thing in containers um, and container world. Um, there was a load of work, both bug fixes, both enhancements, and just general, a huge amount of work from particularly Tim in this case, um, that meant we could transition CSI from beta to general availability. Um, so that's great. There is also a new evaluations UI panel. Um, if you're not familiar with evaluations, if a nomad's running fine, evaluations are something you never really notice. Um, when nomad's not running fine, evaluations are everything to nomad. Um, and so this new UI panel gives a really great oversight, a really great view into how evaluation is working. It even shows the linking between evaluations, and so it gives you a good understanding of what's going on. We had some great Nomad pack improvements. So if you're looking to template and share job specs, um, give that a check out. That's currently in tech preview. Um, and in general, just a load of quality of life improvements. The, the change log for Nomad 1.3 was huge. Um, and it's, it's been nice to have some focus as well on just generally improving the products that we have. If you want to learn more, if you're new to Nomad, um, I definitely recommend checking out the Nomad project site. Uh, 
It's all our documentation. There are links to learn guides on how to run some of these things. There are some really useful case studies as well. So there is Bowery Farming, the smart farm. Um, you can learn about them. Radix, which is a biotech firm. Um, check them out. Uh, if you're just kind of looking at something less specific, the Roblox uh, case study is always interesting about the scale of use of Nomad at, at Roblox and, and how Nomad does there. The demo is available um, on GitHub. Uh, so if you want to run your own Doom servers and not break my cluster, uh, go ahead and do that. Um, I'll be around all conference. Um, in particular, tomorrow, I'll be at the HashiCorp Zone, um, Ask the Expert. So if you have any questions, either after now or later tomorrow, come and find me. There's also experts from kind of all the product lines down there today and tomorrow. Um, if you can't find me or you're going home or whatever, um, feel free to reach out online. Um, if you have feedback about what's terrible, what's good, or just questions, give me a shout. Uh, with that, thank you. Thank you for listening, and I hope you have a great conference.